Very fascinating also that the oldest known ones are from Africa. Yeah. And obviously that's where Egypt is. Yes, and that's, yeah. ex that's exactly where Egypt yeah. is. And, and, and uh, you know, we must, we must recognize Egypt as an African culture. Yeah. That is what the, that is what the ancient Egyptians were. Uh, I believe their language was, uh, belonged to the Hamitic language family, which is closely related to the Somali language, for example, in, 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 in East Africa. African culture, incredibly sophisticated, incredibly advanced, doing stuff that we just don't know how to do today. Archaeologists mm. will tell you they could build the Great Pyramid, but I defy them to do that. The Great Pyramid is literally impossible. It's something that doesn't make any sense. It certainly doesn't make sense as the tomb of a megalomaniac pharaoh, uh, which is what we're told it was. Well, it's also sort of the ultimate if you wanted to leave behind evidence of your culture, something that if there was a cataclysm and people did have to sort of rethink the history of the world, that would be the best thing to leave. Time capsule. Because yeah. it's so insanely sophisticated mm. that you're forced to sort of reckon with this idea that something might have existed before us. Yeah, definitely. And it incorporates all kinds of interesting math. It incorporates pi, which again is supposed to have been discovered by the Greeks. Uh, it incorporates the dimensions of the earth on a particular mm. scale. There, there, there's a lot about the Great Pyramid which suggests that it was intended to transmit information to the future. And that's one of the reasons why it's so big and so enormous and why we keep on finding new chambers and passageways inside the Great Pyramid. There's a thing called Scan Pyramids, which is now going on, which is using the latest tech. And they've identified a second Grand Gallery above the Grand Gallery. The, the Grand Gallery is one of the wonderful features of the Great Pyramid. It's 30 feet high, 120 feet long rising up through the center of the pyramid but now we know there's a second one above it that hasn't been explored yet and that's wow. a, that's a result of scanned pyramids there's corridors and passageways that we didn't know were there so the great pyramid is gradually bit by bit revealing its secrets and it's almost as though it was waiting for a time when human beings were ready to receive those secrets and had and had the ability to decode them how do they access the second grand gallery scanning it's all I mean humans how can humans get well, into it it could it could that's a very, a very good question it's there the question is at what point was it made was it was it part of, it should have been part of the original construction of the great pyramid as they were building the great pyramid they created one grand gallery and they created another is it I, the same size it looks to be the same size yeah from the wow. from the scanning which the scanning just shows a, a, a void mm. but i'm informed reliably that the the recent investigation has identified that void as another grand gallery which is inside the great pyramid and the grand gallery is one of the wonders of the world so it could have artifacts in it it, it could have artifacts in it same goes for those shafts that cut through the walls of the queen's so-called queen's chamber and king's chamber i I resist these names that archaeologists have applied to the Great Pyramid. I resist the notion that it was the tomb of Khufu. Uh, I resist the notion that the subterranean chamber, which is 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid, was intended to be Khufu's tomb chamber. But then they just changed their minds and abandoned it. And then they built the one that's now called the Queen's Chamber. That was intended to be for Khufu, but they abandoned that as well. Then they went up the Grand Gallery and they created the so-called King's Chamber. And because it has a sarcophagus in it, and for no other reason, that is said to have been the original burial place of Khufu. It's not enough evidence in my view. And the connections to Khufu are from hieroglyphs depicting his vision that if he uncovered the Sphinx, he would become the pharaoh of Egypt. Isn't there something along those lines? There is a there is something along those lines, and it's Thutmosis the fourth or the third, if I remember correctly. In other words, he's a later pharaoh from the time of uh, of the old kingdom, uh, and and he put between the paws of the Sphinx a stella, which is called the dream stella, and in it he records a dream that he had. That that time the Sphinx was buried up to its neck in sand. And the dream was that uh, that he should clear the Sphinx. The Sphinx requested him or ordered him to free it of sand uh, and reveal it again in, in its true form. This was at least uh, 1,200 years after the Sphinx is supposed to have been built 4,500 years ago. Mm. But as you know, Robert Schock and I and, and many others are convinced the Sphinx is much, much older than that, that it goes back. 12,000 plus years. And this is based on geological evidence of heavy rainfall, which is another <clears throat> interesting thing about the climate and the environment of that area. 
that we think of it as being desert, but at one point in time it wasn't. Well, this is this is one of the reasons why I'm so frustrated by archaeologists claiming that they can know there was no lost civilization when they've done <coughs> so little work in the Sahara. When the Sahara was, in a number of occasions during the Ice Age, incredibly fertile very, very nurturing environment with huge river systems running through it and lakes. It's not disputed that that was the case. It was a kind of environment that would have nurtured human civilization. Uh, and we really can't write off the possibility of a lost civilization until we take a much closer, much more detailed look at the Sahara. Of course, that's expensive. And then Egypt itself is in the Sahara. Didn't they find fossilized whale bones in the Sahara? Yeah, that would go back a lot further. That would go back to to millions of years, to, to a time when the oceans were different, perhaps even hundreds of millions of years. So Sahara at one point in time <coughs> was an ocean. As many places were, wow. it, uh, pre pretty much anywhere where you find, you find limestone was once was once covered by by ocean. The world has changed. The world is yeah. constantly changing. It's like it's like one of those magic kids' toys where you pull pull a lever and it wipes out the diagram you just made. You know, yeah. um, it just keeps on. The world keeps on recreating itself, and we human beings make our journey through this through this changing world, and we we try to fix it and say, this is how things were, this is how things will be, and it never cooperates with us on it's that. It's just incredibly fascinating that the timeline, when you go beyond the traditional timeline, and you get back into where you and Robert Schock have speculated the age of the, sp the Sphinx, now you're talking about a completely different environment of lush rainforests yes. and many, many, many resources. Absolutely. We're talking about a completely different Sahara. Which and Schock's kind of evidence is of a thousand years of heavy rainfall. That's mm. what the Sphinx bears witness to, that it was already there when the rains of the Younger Dryas and the Younger Dryas affected the Sahara with heavy rainfall. Just as further north, it changed the climate and made it much colder in the Sahara, it became much wetter. Uh, and it's that period of rains that, uh, that are the most likely culprit for weathering the Sphinx in the way it is. But it could have stood there for thousands of years before that. There's you know? also very clear evidence that the face in the Sphinx is much younger, right? No doubt about that whatsoever. The, the, <coughs> the evidence takes, <coughs> excuse me, frog in my throat. There's a little 